Hello, my name is Ruslan Najatov. I'm a professor at Yale University School of Medicine and an investigator from Howard Hughes Medical Institute. In this lecture, I will discuss uh, inflammation and I'll give a brief overview of the field of inflammation and uh, its role in both uh, post-defense and homeostasis as well as uh, in pathologies. So inflammation is an enormously huge field uh, with a lot of details known about some aspects of inflammation. And to, to be able to summarize it in, in this short uh, overview, uh, I will use a couple of perspectives that summarize some key features of inflammation. And uh, specifically, I will start by putting inflammation in the context of uh, better understood uh, and better defined uh, phenomenon of homeostasis. And I'll show the similarities, parallels, and uh, how the two types of processes uh, interact with each other, causing both beneficial and detrimental outcomes. So just to remind you, homeostasis uh, uh, maintains stability of biological systems in the face of perturbations. And perturbations could be either external or internal to the system. And inflammation is induced when these perturbations exceed homeostatic capacity of the system. So schematically, this could be summarized as follows. If we imagine uh, the position of this ball as the state of the system, uh, here in the center, you can see in the normal state, uh, the uh, homeostasis is maintained by keeping the state of the system in the desired position. And when it deviates from that position, homeostatic mechanisms will bring it back. But if perturbation is large enough and uh, the system goes uh, outside of its uh, normal control zone, outside of its normal homeostatic range, uh, then homeostatic capacity no longer sufficient to keep uh, the system in a desired state, and that's when inflammation is induced to force the system back into the homeostatic state. That's uh, one way to think about connections between homeostasis and, and inflammation. So inflammation is something that forces the system to go back into homeostatic state when perturbations are large enough uh, and when they overwhelm homeostatic capacity. In modern terms, we can uh, describe homeostasis uh, using the idea of a control circuit. And this is a very simple but very fundamental uh, concept. So here, what is summarized on this slide is uh, key components of homeostatic circuit. And Whenever we speak about homeostasis, that means that we talk about maintenance of some variable of the system. It could be blood sugar, it could be temperature, it could be sodium, it could be any of the variables of the systems that uh, the system cares about and wants to maintain. So that's what's denoted here as X. And uh, when we refer to homeostasis of this variable, that means we want to keep it close to some desired value. And that's what's called set point value x prime here. So the, it is the value of that variable or difference of that variable uh, value from the set point value is what monitored by the sensor. Sensor is the component of homeostatic circuit that monitors the value of variable the system cares about. And the second uh, essential part of the system is the effector part. And that's the part that can change that value. So sensor monitors the value, effector can change the value. And they need to communicate with each other through a signal that's denoted as C here. So for example, in the case of uh, systemic homeostasis of blood glucose, uh, X would be the actual concentration of glucose in the blood. X prime would be the set point value, which is in, in humans about five millimolar. And the sensors would be pancreatic alpha and beta cells that monitor how much glucose we have in the blood. After you ate, glucose level goes up. Beta cells in the pancreas will detect that and will start producing insulin, which is the example of the signal shown here, which will go on to act on its effectors, uh, which include skeletal muscle, fat, and liver. And the effect of insulin on this target tissues would be to lower blood glucose level. For example, by inducing uptake into those tissues or conversion into glycogen or lipids. If glucose level is lower than set point value, then alpha cells of the pancreas will detect that low, le low level and start producing a different hormone, which is glucagon, which will act again on effector cells or effector tissues and organs, for example, liver, 
and cause them to start producing glucose to raise it to, ra to raise the level to the desired uh, value. So that's how homeostatic circuit works uh, at, at uh, organismal level, uh, tissue level, and cellular level. Uh, now, the origin of the concept of inflammation goes back uh, to, um, it can be uh, credited to many people, but uh, the two that I want to highlight here is uh, Rudolf Virchow and Ilan Mechnikov, who were contemporaries uh, and colleagues. Um, and uh, so Virchow, of course, is credited with the development of modern science of pathology, of cellular pathology. And uh, he was an extremely influential uh, uh, scientists in Europe at the time. And Ilan Mechnikov, of course, uh, is uh, known for his discovery of phagocytes and its, uh, their role in innate immunity. But in the context of inflammation, these two individuals uh, provided uh, very important uh, conceptual contributions. But there was one important difference between them in that Virchow primarily viewed inflammation as a pathological process. Whereas Mechnikov recognized early on that in addition to these pathological outcomes of inflammation, that the, the primary uh, reason for inflammatory response is to provide protection from infections. And he uh, visualized uh, and conceptualized the inflammatory response as being part of a spectrum, uh, where at the base of the spectrum would be what he called harmony, disharmony balance. And this, what we currently would call homeostasis, but the term homeostasis wasn't coined yet until 1929. Then uh, the next level would be physiological inflammation, when inflammation plays uh, beneficial roles uh, in cause defense, then pathological inflammation, and finally immunity. And that, uh, that concept of physiological inflammation and uh, the spectrum of inflammatory response from homeostasis to immunity is actually a very profound insight which was largely forgotten until very recently. And only now we are starting to rediscover and realize these fundamental connections between physiological processes and uh, inflammation. So taking that Meshnikov's idea and putting it uh, in uh, uh, looking from different dimension, we can summarize it as follows, as, as the spectrum of degrees of deviation from homeostatic states. So here on the, on the left side, you see uh, uh, the range of conditions of a system that would be within homeostatic state. If it deviates far enough from that, that would what we would call a stress response, or we could also call it a physiological inflammatory response. And if it uh, deviates much further, then that's what we would call inflammation proper. And so this, any deviation from normal state, therefore, can, be, can lead to the induction of the inflammatory response. So the causes of inflammation from that perspective can be summarized as follows. Uh, in the center here, in the middle, you can see that loss of homeostasis per se is sufficient to lead to inflammation, as, as I just mentioned. But in addition, uh, there could be exogenous perturbations that can lead to loss of homeostasis. And the two major types of such perturbations would be pathogens uh, during infection, as well as toxins and allergens and virulence factors produced by uh, pathogens. So both pathogens and, uh, and toxins can cause loss of inflammation, uh, loss of homeostasis, that, and that can lead to inflammation. But in the addition, the immune system developed two preemptive mechanisms to trigger protective inflammatory response even before pathogens or allergens can cause damage to the system. And there are two fundamental ways that the immune system detects these inducers of inflammation. At the top here, what I call structural feature recognition, is the property of the innate immune system to detect invariant structures associated with uh, microbial uh, cells. Uh, this is sometimes called pattern recognition uh, system, where receptors of the immune system detect conserved structures that are found in most microbes. For example, lipopolysaccharides of the cell wall, or pepsidoglycans, lipotycoic acids, and so on. And detection of these structures is sufficient to trigger inflammation. 
On the other hand, allergens and toxins and virulence factors, they're extremely diverse. There are, there are many different types, and there is no way to detect them all based on structural features because they don't share any structural features. And the strategy of recognition here is uh, what I would call a functional feature recognition because what is detected is not specific structures, but rather specific biochemical activities such as protease activities, lipase activities, uh, uh, lipid binding, membrane perturbations, pore formation, and so on. Those functional features are detected by that system, and that also can lead to inflammation. And that type of uh, strategy is particularly important in allergic inflammation. So based on these ideas, we now can uh, summarize how the immune system operates based on the simple uh, logic of the control circuits. So we know that immune system uh, one of the major functions of the immune system is to detect pathogens and to uh, pro provide a protective response against them by, for example, destroying them or expelling them from the uh, organism. To do so, the immune system has to have two essential components. It has to have uh, a pathogen sensing component uh, uh, or pathogen sensing cells, and it has to have an antimicrobial effector cells. And sensor and effector cells have to communicate with each other through a signal. And once the effector receives the signal from the sensor, it elicits a response that leads to uh, defense from the pathogen. So that's a very simplified view of the immune system. And the signals that are involved in communication between sensors and effectors is what contributes to this uh, enormous complexity of inflammation uh, and understanding of the immunity. Uh, there are many different types of signals. In the context of inflammation, these signals are usually called inflammatory mediators. Um, and two major types of inflammatory mediators are uh, signals called chemokines and cytokines. Uh, chemokines are sh uh, short polypeptides that are produced uh, upon uh, infection uh, by sensor cells that detect pathogens. Uh, or tissue damage. And what chemokines do, they recruit effector cells to the site of infection. For example, macrophages that function as sensor cells, when they detect bacterial pathogens, will produce chemokines that will recruit neutrophils to the site of infection, and then neutrophils will take care of the pathogens. The second type of inflammatory mediators are cytokines. And this is, a, again, a very diverse group of signals that belong to different uh, structural families. But basically, what cytokines do, uh, they, they, again, are produced by sensor cells when they detect infection, and they activate effector cells to elicit various uh, antimicrobial functions. So with this in mind, we now can summarize uh, much of the uh, inflammation and diversity of inflammation into this uh, simple and universal components of the inflammatory pathway. Any type of inflammation includes these four universal components. There is always some type of an inducer of inflammation, for example, pathogen, toxin, tissue damage, or loss of homeostasis. There are sensors uh, that detect the inducers. These include uh, various types of cells of the innate immune system, such as macrophages and mast cells but also uh, various types of sensory neurons. And these sensor cells uh, produce inflammatory mediators, which include cytokines, chemokines, uh, as well as bioactive amines like histamine, uh, peptides like bradykinin, as well as uh, lipid mediators called eicosanoids, which include, for example, prostaglandins. And these mediators then act on various target tissues, and almost any tissue in the body can be target for different types of inflammatory mediators. Uh, so here uh, I'm showing liver, uh, vasculature, epithelial cells, and neutrophils. When mediators act on these effector cells, they cause appropriate changes in their state, in their function, or in their positioning. Again, chemokines can recruit neutrophils to the site of infection, uh, cytokines acting on uh, hepatocytes or uh, vascular endothelium will cause their activation, change in protein secretion or permeability of the epithelium. Uh, 
and uh, in the case of mucosal epithelium, they can change uh, the uh, production of uh, antimicrobial peptides or, or uh, mucus. So this is this inflammatory pathway, and as you as you may have noticed, uh, there is uh, um, this is uh, very much uh, related to it's the same kind of a control circuit we just discussed for homeostasis, where we have a sensor, a signal that con connects sensor to the effector and the effector. Uh, the only difference is that in this case, the, uh, what is monitored is not homeostatic variable, but rather some inducer of inflammation, such as a pathogen or toxin. So there are these clear parallels between homeostatic and inflammatory control circuits. Uh, the reason for that has to do with just fundamental importance of this type of control circuits. They're everywhere, uh, from engineering systems to biological systems. And again, uh, the differences between them are uh, in related to the types of inducers that are, uh, that are detected by sensors or uh, homeostatic variables detected by homeostatic sensors. But we should also uh, keep in mind that sometimes the differences between homeostatic and inflammatory control circuits can be arbitrary because inflammatory mediators used by, by inflammatory uh, circuits can also have some homeostatic functions and uh, homeostatic signals used uh, by homeostatic circuits uh, uh, can participate in regulation of the inflammatory response. There are actually two different design uh, versions of the control circuits. Here on the top is the control circuit I just mentioned. That's the simplest one where you just have sensor and an effector and the signal that connects them. There is another uh, type of a circuit which has an additional component in between and that's what's called a controller or integrating uh, unit. So here we have sensor that monitors uh, an inflammatory inducer or homeostatic variable. It produces signal that then acts on the controller and then controller does some type of a computation and then sends a second signal to the effector. This type of a design is particularly prevalent uh, in both immune and um, uh, nervous systems. In the case of the immune system, the, the role of a controller is typically played by a lymphocyte. And in the case of the nervous system, uh, it's played by various types of um, uh, interneurons. So uh, sensor cells, uh, again, after detecting the inducer, produce one signal and then controller produces a second signal. And these two types of signals are distinct in the immune system, as we will discuss. So from that perspective, we can summarize uh, the entire operation of the immune system as, uh, as connection between pathogen sensors and effectors. And there are three types of these connections. The simplest one is shown at the top, where the sensor and the effector is the same entity, the same cell. Uh, the sensor would be, for example, a receptor, and the effector would be, for example, an antimicrobial uh, enzyme. The second type uh, is when sensor uh, produces a signal that acts on the effector, as we just discussed, and the third type when there is a lymphocyte in between. And the first two types belong entirely to the uh, domain of the innate immune system, and the second, uh, the, uh, the third one uh, it can be either innate or adaptive immune system, depending on the type of lymphocyte involved. So we will uh, go through uh, the different versions of these uh, circuits to illustrate how uh, they operate in the context of infection. So the simplest one is when a cell like macrophage encounters a pathogen like a bacterium, phagocytosis, and kills it. So in this case, the sensor would be receptors that detect microbe, and the effectors would be phagocytic machinery and lysomal enzymes that will keep the microbe. So that's the simplest one. The more, more commonly, when macrophages detect pathogens, they will produce a signal that will connect them to the effector, such as a neutrophil, uh, and it will either recruit or activate neutrophils, and neutrophils are specialized in killing bacteria and fungi, and uh, they will proceed to do so, and then uh, the system uh, operates uh, in this manner to uh, provide protection from infection. And finally, the third, third uh, design would be when cell sensor cells like macrophages again detect pathogens. Uh, 
then they produce cytokines that act on now on lymphocyte first. And then lymphocytes uh, that could involve uh, T cells or different types of innate versions of T cells that I'll describe in a second, which then produces second order cytokines. Uh, in this case, uh, first order cytokine would be AL12 produced by macrophage, exon lymphocyte, and causes lymphocyte to produce second order cytokines such as intron gamma which will then act on effector cells that could be macrophages and cause them to become activated to kill bacteria. So this design is actually captures uh, most of the operation of the immune system and most of the complexity comes from the generation of lymphocytes and their functional heterogeneities. So we, we now we'll go quickly through different components of this system, starting with sensors. Uh, there are several cell types that can function as sensors uh, uh, in the inflammatory and immune pathways. These include macrophages, mast cells, uh, epithelial cells, uh, dendritic cells, and plasmocytoid dendritic cells. So these are different uh, sensor cells that uh, have different types of specializations, macrophages, Mast cells, epithelial cells are kind of a general purpose sensors. They detect a, a, a large variety of uh, uh, pathogens and other types of inflammatory inducers. Uh, dendritic cells are specialized on activating uh, T cells, and plasmacytoid dendritic cells are specialized on antiviral responses. The lymphocyte part uh, is, that's where a lot of complexity comes in. Um, uh, they can be, uh, there are two versions of uh, circuits depending on what kind of lymphocyte is used. And uh, broadly speaking, there are innate lymphocytes that participate in the innate immune system and uh, lymphocytes involved in adaptive immune system, which is T and B cells. The innate lymphocytes again come in two versions. There are so-called innate lymphoid cells, which are have been relatively recently discovered. They don't have T cell receptor. They reside in tissues and they respond to cytokines produced by sensor cells and in, in turn produce cytokines that affect effectors. Then there are innate like lymphocytes that have T cell receptor, but it's not a uh, random receptor, it's invariant, so it's designed to detect very specific subset uh, of antigens. And finally, the adaptive immune system, of course, has uh, antigen receptors, T cell receptor, and immunoglobulin receptor for B cells. And these are the most complicated cells of the immune system because of the way that they develop and because of the way that the receptors are assembled and all the additional steps that are involved to make the cells functional because their receptors are generated at random. Again, when lymphocytes detect cytokines, they respond by producing cytokines. And uh, what's summarized here are some of the uh, types of cytokines that on the left side that act on lymphocytes and uh, different types of lymphocytes and uh, second order cytokines produced by lymphocytes. And then these cytokines uh, produced by lymphocytes then again act on effector cells, which are uh, examples are shown here, macrophages, neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, mast cells, and epithelial cells. Depending on the type of cytokine produced, there would be different type of change in these cell uh, effector cell types. And in addition to these specialized uh, effectors of the innate immune system, uh, practically any cell in the body can be an effector uh, because most cells express receptors for at least some of the cytokines produced by uh, lymphocytes. So now we will uh, quickly go over uh, with these concepts in mind, we will look over uh, some of the key uh, features of the inflammatory response. And we have to start with uh, uh, one of the oldest notions uh, in the field of inflammation, which is the cardinal science of inflammation. These were first uh, defined by uh, a Roman physician, uh, Cornelius Celsus, in first century AD. Uh, he defined them as uh, uh, redness and swelling with heat and pain. Uh, that was his uh, uh, description of how to diagnose inflammation. And much later, Rudolf Virchow added a, a fifth cardinal sign of inflammation, which is uh, disturbance of function or loss of function of tissues. The four cardinal signs described by Celsus are consequence of the changes that occur during acute inflammation. Uh, and uh, these are local changes due to... Um, 
uh, alterations in the local vasculature, as we will uh, discuss next. So this is what typically happens uh, during the most common types of inflammatory responses when you have um, uh, a mild infection or paper cut or some other or splinter or some other injury to the uh, epithelial surfaces. So microbes or uh, uh, damage to the tissue uh, uh, are detected by sensor cells, uh, such as macrophage, dendritic cell, and mast cells, as I just mentioned. And once they detect microbes or tissue damage, these cells start producing inflammatory mediators, such as cytokines and chemokines. And one of the effects of these inflammatory mediators uh, locally within the tissue is to act on the local uh, microvasculature. And specifically, they, by acting on postcapillary venules, they uh, cause several characteristic changes of the endothelium of the venules. Uh, they cause <clears throat> vasodilation, so there is increased blood flow. And increased blood flow causes heat uh, and redness. And it causes um, increased vascular permeability, so that plasma starts going from the inside of blood vessel into extravascular uh, spaces within tissues. And that causes swelling or edema. Uh, and uh, together, the edema and effect of inflammatory mediators uh, also can cause uh, pain. So redness, swelling, heat, and pain are all causes of these uh, vascular changes that occur locally. Another important change that happens is that endothelium within uh, postcapillary venules becomes activated in the sense that it now becomes, uh, uh, acquires adhesive properties so, such that uh, neutrophils and monocytes uh, and other cell types that go through blood vessels, normally they would just pass through. But when, uh, if there is a in local inflammation, the local endothelium becomes sticky so that these cells now adhere or attach to endothelium and ultimately they crawl through the uh, endothelial wall into the tissue. And that's the process called extravasation. And the point of that process is to deliver the circulating effector cells to the site of infection. And actually, Eli Meshiko was the first to recognize that that's the point of uh, vascular changes uh, uh, during inflammation. So once neutrophils and other effector cells get to the site of the inflammation, where inflammation is induced, they will then seek out uh, pathogens and will destroy them or, or repair the damaged tissue. Another important point that uh, was realized probably in the last uh, decade or so is that um, once inflammation accomplished its goal, which is uh, elimination of pathogens, for example, uh, that is not enough to get back to the normal state. Um, if you just eliminated the cause of inflammation, it doesn't mean that the system automatically goes back by default into homeostatic state. There is another phase uh, between inflammation and homeostatic state that's called resolution that needs to be actively engaged. This is analogous to a situation if you have, for example, a broken pipe and there is flooding in the system. The cause of the mess would be the broken pipe. So let's say you fix the pipe, but it doesn't mean that the system now back into its original state. Now you have all the water in the floor and you need to get rid of it to return actively back to homeostatic state. So that's what resolution does. After inflammation accomplished its goal, uh, there is a lot of uh, mass within the tissue. There are many dead cells. There is uh, destroyed extracellular matrix. And all of that has to be uh, cleaned up and changed back to the original state. And of course, this is something that requires a highly uh, orchestrated and uh, regulated process. And that's what resolution does. Uh, and resolution of inflammation is a, a very important still not fully understood process, uh, but it's, uh, it's well recognized now that it's an active process. It's not just passive sensation of inflammation and that it's needed to restore the homeostatic state. An additional uh, important um, point to understand about inflammation is that there are not just different types of inflammation based on the causes, but there are also different modalities of inflammation. And they are um, historically defined as acute and chronic uh, modalities of inflammatory response. Uh, 
So they, as the name implies, acute and chronic inflammation obviously differ in duration. Acute inflammation can last from uh, hours and, uh, to days, and chronic inflammation typically can last uh, uh, from weeks to uh, months to years. But more importantly, it's not just the kinetics of the response, uh, but more importantly, acute and chronic inflammation are uh, uh, qualitatively distinct. And the common causes of chronic inflammation include failure to eliminate the inflammatory inducer. For example, if there is a persistent infection, uh, it's a failure of resolution of uh, inflammation. And in some cases, it could be a positive feedback such that the uh, consequence of the inflammatory response, uh, for example, collateral tissue damage, may also be a cause for a secondary inflammatory response. And potentially, that can uh, sustain uh, the inflammatory state. The qualitative differences between acute and chronic inflammation have to do with the types of cells involved. It's mostly uh, neutrophils and eosinophils in acute inflammation, but mostly uh, lymphocytes in uh, chronic inflammation, as well as macrophages. Uh, and there are many other differences related to uh, the type of the mechanism used to, uh, to deal with uh, persistent inflammatory inducer that's used during chronic inflammation. Like other defenses, uh, inflammation always operates at the cost. And these costs can be divided in two distinct categories. The first class of uh, causes of, uh, um, of... the first type of cause of inflammation has to do with intentional suppression of physiological functions that are lower priority than inflammatory response and that are somehow incompatible with the inflammatory response. For example, if you sitting on a couch and watching TV and there is a fire, uh, then watching TV as a function would be incompatible uh, with dealing with the fire. Uh, and it also would be obviously lower priority than dealing with the fire. So you will intentionally stop watching TV. So that would be a cost, but it's a low cost compared to uh, benefit of putting away the fire. And then the second type of cost is unintentional cost. Uh, that is, uh, it's not something you want, uh, but it's something you can't avoid. It's unintentional and unavoidable costs, such as collateral tissue damage. So when you're putting out the fire and putting a water on it, you uh, will cause perhaps some collateral damage to the uh, rest of the room. So these are two different types of costs. And the sum of these two costs has to be lower than the benefit provided by inflammation uh, for, for, for the system to be evolutionarily stable. So inflammation can be pathological, therefore, for several reasons. And uh, what's important to understand is that even appropriately controlled inflammatory response operates at the expense of other functions. So it's often said that inflammation is beneficial, but when dysregulated, can be pathological. We should appreciate that even perfectly controlled inflammatory response operate at the cost, and sometimes this cost can manifest as symptoms that we may uh, refer to as a disease. The second uh, uh, reason for pathology of inflammation is when the response is excessive and uh, either in magnitude or in duration. And the third cause would be when the response is induced when it shouldn't be induced. For example, when it's uh, mistargeted against uh, something that is not harmful. And this is summarized uh, in this schematic. Uh, when inflammation causes swelling, pain, fever, mucus overproduction, coughing, sneezing, diarrhea, these are all defenses. These are all manifestations of defenses. They are protective from different types of noxious challenges, but obviously all of them are uh, processes that come at a cost. We do feel ill when we experience those reactions, even though they are protective. And what makes it worse is when they're protective but excessive, then they would be clearly just pathological. And so these are two different uh, outcomes that need to be distinguished when pathology is due to excessive response versus when pathology is simply the cost we have to pay for a normal response. And then the third type of uh, pathological outcome is more uh, obvious, is when there is a just collateral tissue damage or mistargeted response. So when we put it this way, it's clear that the three types of pathological outcomes are very different. And for example, you don't want to interfere with the first one. You want to dial down the second one. 
and you want to stop the third one. And the challenge is to be able to distinguish which one they belong to so that we know what to do with them. So the take-home messages uh, in this brief overview is that inflammation is normally a protective response to infection and injury and other and uh, loss of tissue homeostasis. Uh, that it's induced when homeostatic capacity is overwhelmed uh, and that um, all of the diversity and complexity of inflammation can be summarized in terms of the inflammatory pathway that consists of inducers, sensors that detect them, mediators they produce, and the effectors that eliminate the inducers. And inflammation is normally followed by a resolution phase, which, which returns the system to homeostasis. And uh, inflammatory response always operates at the cost to incompatible uh, lower priority functions, and inflammation can cause pathology when it's excessive, inappropriately induced, uh, or due to collateral damage. And that uh, completes this uh, overview. Um, uh, I will discuss in the next talk uh, some specific uh, examples of inflammation in the context of uh, inflammatory diseases, and uh, thank you for your attention.